Okay, so our next talk will be from Neil Stepp, who's a PhD student at Cornell University, and he'll be telling us about SPECTRE, uh, which is a new astrophysics code being developed at Cornell. All right. Um, okay, so, yeah, uh, I'm here representing the Simulating Extreme Space Times collaboration. We're an international collaboration between Cornell, Caltech, University of Toronto, and the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, Germany. And so what we're working on is basically we, we need a next generation code. Our current code works well for binary black holes, but it only scales to about 100 to 1,000 cores. And that's just not going to get us the kind of turnaround time we need for when LIGO detects gravitational waves more frequently. Um, so uh, please interrupt me, because uh, first I'll give an overview of what we've been able to do so far. Most of that work was done before I started working on this. Then I'm going to jump ship to template metaprogramming uh, because I think this is sort of the future and, and I want to ad advocate for it. And then I'll explain how I'm using template metaprogramming in Spectre. And, and so please, if anything, I will be showing some code. If anything's not clear, jump in and just ask questions. All right, so the, the goals of Spectre are basically similar to all, all the talks we've heard, we need multi-scale multi-physics in relativistic astrophysics. And so the reason our, our kind of background is, well, we have binary black holes, so you have two black holes, they're orbiting each other, they eventually merge, and then we are now able to actually detect gravitational waves from them. And so this means that we need to be good, as good enough that the experimentalists don't look at our output and say, oh, well, we can't use that. Um, so we actually have stringent error criterion for these things. So black holes were able to do very well, but there's no matter. It's actually sort of, quote, easy. Um, you, it's just an empty space time, that's it. You solve Einstein's equations and you carry on. But the, the hard part is neutron stars. Um, so neutron stars, they emit basically in everything possible that we could detect. Uh, neutron stars emit gravitational waves. They emit through the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and they emit in neutrinos. So we need to be able to handle things over large scales. So neutrinos is typically done through ray tracing. The actual magnetic fields, you do use magnetohydrodynamics, the relativistic version. And then we have to handle all the shocks that are present in the neutron stars as they merge. And so the neutron stars are orbiting each other at about half the speed of light when they collide. And so, of course, the shocks and everything are moving near the speed of light. And so that presents quite a few problems for us. And while doing that, we still need to be able to extract gravitational waves at about 500 radii versus f out from, from the neutron star. So if you say the neutron star has a radius of roughly one, then we are extracting gravitational waves at a few hundred radii of that. So we have several orders of magnitude to cover, and everything is moving really fast. The other problem is uh, core collapse supernovae. So basically, you have su a star, it explodes, and you get a resulting supernovae. This, again, you ultimately get neutron stars out of, and so you have the same problems. You have hydrodynamics happening at a whole bunch of different scales. You have to handle neutrino transport, a whole bunch of other microphysics. These equations become stiff. And as we learned yesterday, explicit if you can do explicit time stepping, it's easy. There, you can't. And so. The other thing we're hoping is that because we have to develop all the stuff to really work for exascale, that maybe we can convince other people to tag in their equations. So one thing that we've basically been thinking about the code is how can we make it as general and as easy to use as possible? So that's sort of the physics goals. In terms of HPC, we want to open source this code. This is something that I've been pushing for now and is, we're currently in the process of doing. It, of course, needs to be efficient, and we need to be able to target exascale. So that's that's kind of the main goals of this code. Um, so the previous generation, what we do is we use charm++ for parallelization. So we're solving partial differential equations using discontinuous Galerkin methods. Uh, these are sort of similar to finite element. The idea is that near shocks, they be behave more like a finite volume scheme. And if your solution is smooth, you get exponential convergence, like in a spectral method. So you can use 10 grid points and get an a relative truncation error of 10 to the minus 10, which is something that's very difficult to do with finite volume. This code, we, it was basically a toy code, so we handled uniform Cartesian grids. We were able to do a bunch of different physics, simple scalar waves to relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. 
Uh, and then just last summer, after we sort of said, OK, this was working, we were going to move on to the next generation, um, we had a grad student who got in the Einstein equations as well. So we're able to basically evolve everything we need to be able to evolve. And so really, the main thing is that we were able to get it, do a successful study of task-based parallelism using Charm++ and discontinuous Galerkin. So like I said, this was a closed source toy code. It was largely developed before I joined. And so there's a paper here in JCompFiz, and the archive number is there. Uh, so the main sort of takeaway was, OK, we ran on Blue Waters and said, OK, well, how well can we scale to the full machine? And so the difference is here are largely just different builds of Charm++. So we wrote this code, or it was written on a laptop. This again, was before I joined. Wrote it on a laptop, compiled it on Blue Waters, and ran it just to see what happens. Um, and that's not perfect. There's obviously optimization to be done, but that's not bad. You know, you, we, like I said, we developed it on a four-core laptop, and that's the output. So that gives us some hope that this is actually feasible. Uh, so we then said, OK, what do we need to do in order to really get this code to be multidisciplinary and easy to use? So we have a lot of physics grad students. And physics grad students are trained physicists. They're not trained computer scientists. And so we need to make sure that they can just come in, write the little physics they need to write, and it'll actually work well. So for that, we said, OK, well, we, we need to, on top of Charm++, plus build a very modular and abstract kind of communication method. And the code needs to be modular if we want it to be multidisciplinary, because if you're doing some sort of CFD simulation, you don't want to have to bring in modules for finding black holes, because you're not going to have those. That wouldn't make any sense. And then the other thing for us is we want kind of a type-safe data retrieval. So we need some abstract data structure uh, that is easy to use efficient and type safe, because runtime errors are evil, um, especially if you want to run on a big machine. So our goal is basically that we have zero runtime errors. If you do something silly, the compiler will go, what are you doing? Don't do that. And hopefully with a set, I assert actually give you something better than 40 pages of template errors. So um, the solution to, to, to these problems is actually kind of all the same. Uh, so we have some requirements on this container. So it needs to be able to hold disparate types. So I need to be able to hold, in GR, we have tensors. Different tensors are different types. I need to be able to hold vectors. I need to be able to hold maps, anything like this. And so since at some point at compile time, I actually need to know these types, I would like to retain that information. And I want to be able to look this stuff up efficiently, preferably at compile time. So one solution is you can use an unordered map between strings and then boost any's. So if you're not familiar with boost any, it just does type erasure and lets you stick basically anything into that and retrieve it later. Um, the problem with this is that you don't know what you're getting out. So you have to know what type the string is. Right? So if I say, OK, I want to get the inverse Jacobian, I have to know that it's a matrix and the indices are up and down and these kinds of things. So that's not good. Uh, the other option is you can use a std tuple. The problem with a std tuple is that, at least for me, the number, the, the way you get things out of a std tuple is you pass it an integer. You say, hey, I want the third thing in this tuple. And at least for me, the number three doesn't really correspond to inverse Jacobian, say. So this works. This gives us all of these things. But it's really not user friendly at all. So it really fails in there. And so we need something that sort of does all of this. And so uh, before I, I, I will sort of build up to the answer by reviewing some basic concepts in template metaprogramming and then telling you what the actual solution to all of this is. So uh, here, just let's, let's just, I'm going to step back and say, OK, let's think of a problem here. So I want, I have some function, and it computes something, and it returns a double. So let's just worry about, focus on this for now. And so it might take a sequence, or it might take some other container. I don't know, and I don't care. I want to compute the L2 norm of the quantities inside. And so I want to write one function, preferably, or at least from the user perspective, that does this. You call that function, and it just gives you the L2 norm out, done, end of story. 
Uh, the problem, though, is that for associative containers like std map, std unordered map, when you iterate over it, the iterator is a key value pair. Right? And I only care about the value. However, for a sequence, the iterator is just the value. So I, I need a two different algorithm for these two things. So what I can do is I can write this function template and then choose which function I use based on whether or not it is associative or whether it is a sequence. Right? So if it's a sequence, I can iterate over it and just do the simple thing of plus equals and return the L2 norm. If it's associative, I need to get the value out of the key value pair that I'm iterating over. And so this allows me to write two functions. This will work for any container that you write that, where, that has an iterator that is either a key value pair or uh, just a simple thing like a vector. And so this means I have almost no code to maintain. And if I find a bug in it, well, I just have to fix the bug in two places. I don't have to scour through the entire code to figure out where some grad student copy pasted the code everywhere. Right? And so this is a, a, an issue that we've had in our current production code, is that there's, there's way too much copy pasting. And so we need generic code. So, um, so th that's a sort of a simpler problem that you can solve with template metaprogramming. And so why should you care about template metaprogramming, really? Uh, the first thing is this generic code, right? You can write fewer functions. You have less code to maintain. And the less code you have to maintain, the less time your developers spend maintaining code. So that's, that's good. The other thing is you can do an insane amount of computations at compile time. Um, so template metaprogramming is Turing complete, which is also sort of bad, because uh, that means you can do anything at compile time. But people have really worked on this to, to improve things a lot. And so you can do complex index lookup. For example, we have a compile time tensor that I've developed so that any sort of tensor structure where you say, I want the 0, 1, 8 index, it gets computed at compile time and looks into a contiguous array. So I can lay all my data out contiguously, and it's all computed at compile time. I have zero runtime cost. There are no assembly instructions. So for example, the tensor thing, this is a domain-specific language example. It's 5,000 lines. Roughly 10 of those are actual runtime code. Everything else is done in compile time. And so this replaced, this just, it eliminates huge classes of bugs. There are just huge classes of bugs that you, we could have in our previous code with these implementations that just, they don't exist. Your code will not compile. And I think that's a big win, because catching these errors at runtime is really annoying, whereas catching them at compile time, at least you know you can't start a simulation and have it die on you. Um, another example here is, so I, I mentioned this catching errors early on. This is big, I think, especially moving into exascale, where you, you don't want to sit in the queue for three days and then have your job die on startup. It's not great. Um, the domain-specific languages, so similar to this tensor, people have developed linear algebra packages like Eigen or Blaze. And so they basically build an abstract syntax tree at compile time and then can manipulate it. So one example that's kind of given more commonly is uh, you want to compute for matrices A and B and a vector V. You want to compute A times B times V. The way you should do that is you should compute B times V, which is a matrix vector, and then A times that result, because that's another matrix vector. So you have fewer floating point operations. And so for a user to do this, this means the user actually has to be aware of it, has to make the right DGEM calls and everything like this. However, the compiler, you can just write this in your meta program, and it'll just make that decision. So you optimize this once, and it goes through your entire code base. Done. And the last kind of pro for template metaprogramming is this is a rapidly growing field. C++11 completely redefined this. C++14 not completely, but largely redefined the playing field once again. And with C++17, everything is a new game one more time. And then likely with C++20, it'll be rewriting the rules once again. So things are changing, but they're changing for the better. Uh, compile times are really being driven down. People have figured out how to make these things make metaprograms orders of magnitude faster than they were in C++03, and just recently people have, on top of that, got it another 100 times faster. So compilation times are really no longer much of an issue. 
There are some cons, of course. It's kind of difficult to learn. If you're used to object-oriented, this is a purely functional programming language. Um, the biggest complaint that I have, probably you know, having learned this, is that there's not much good kind of intro tutorials. And so I'm personally addressing this. Uh, I've started writing some blog posts being like, hey, this is how these things actually work. These are the concepts that I struggled with because it's, it's different. You're, you're manipulating types. So your data is also, everything is a struct. Functions are structs, variables are structs, everything is a struct. And so learning how to differentiate between those was a non-trivial task. And so this is something that luckily people are now trying to be, get better. The other thing is how do you, how do you debug and optimize metaprograms? Um, because really you're at that point debugging and optimizing the compiler. And so a template, which is available on GitHub, I, I have nothing to do with this other than to advocate for it, allows you to patch Clang, and then you can actually look at template instantiations. You can, it offers a GDB-like interface. You can step forward, step back, see what in template instantiations you're doing. And you can also profile it. So if you're used to using CallGrind to visualize things, this will just output CallGrind or various other formats. And you can profile both compile time and memory usage. And so this gives you now, there are, there's very serious effort underway for actually dealing with these kinds of problems that you get as metaprograms grow. OK, so our, our, our issue is still, uh, to kind of re refresh, is we need a data structure that allows us to be user friendly and efficient, as preferably at compile time. So I think Joseph will be familiar with uh, this idea of tags. Um, and so something human readable is a string. So we ideally want some sort of a map. And so it turns out that if I have a struct, the name is basically a string. So that gives me something. Uh, then these things can, of course, be templates. So you can have template parameters there. And then inside the struct, I can just add a type alias to whatever type this is. So this gives me a map between names and types. Right? So that takes us part of the way there. We want to remember what type information we have. Um, so now we need to go, OK, we have names and types. We need to index this maybe to integers, because something like a std tuple would work reasonably well. So the answer is uh, we need some sort of a sequence. And a sequence at compile time is a type list. So this is just a simple, empty, variadic struct template. And so then what you do is you just stick in a bunch of template parameters. And those are then indexed 0 through n minus 1. All right, so for example, here I define a meta variable. Um, so type aliases are typically used as meta variables. So I use a meta variable, which is a type list of tag 0 through tag 3. All right, so this is a std vector, basically, but at compile time. He's smiling. I don't <laughs> it's, it's fun stuff. It's, it's, it's magic, yeah, but it's fun stuff. Um, once you start figuring it out, it's really impressive what you can do. And so then uh, this, this gets me, I can build a vector, right? So this is now my vector of types. And so now I have the, the tag name, and this, these all have associated inside them a type. And then from this, I now can get an index of it, right? These are enumerated. And so I can write some meta function index of, or as you should do, use some template metaprogramming library because you do not want to write all these things yourself. Uh, and this will just return the index of this. So here I wrote a little wrapper meta function, which just takes the tag and for my list returns the index. So if tag here, if this template parameter is tag two, this returns two. If it's zero, tag zero, it returns zero and so on. And so, of course, if this were you know, inverse Jacobian uh, grid coordinates, the density and the velocity, then if you said, oh, hey, give me the index of velocity, it'll just give you three. And so this gives you a map between arbitrary sort of strings at compile time to integers. Right? And so now uh, this is the real fun stuff. How do we combine this with std tuple, right? So we now have some way of going between types or names to integers, which we can look up in a tuple. And so now we need to build all of this. So 
I'm going to go through this slowly because that's probably the right thing to do. And again, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Um, so this tag tuple, what it does is it takes a list of tags. So you just, when you call this, you just pass in a comma separated list of tags as the template parameters. You derive publicly off of a std tuple. So that means a tag tuple can be cast to a std tuple at compile time. The std tuple, you need to tell it what types it has inside of it. And the types that I'm storing are the types held inside the tags, right? These guys. This is the types that are held in the std tuple. All right, so I can do that by just, you know, you need to use the type name keyword, colon, colon, type, and then these dot, dot, dots. Uh, if you do metaprogramming, you will learn that these things are great. These are really fast. Uh, this means take everything in here and expand it. So this code expands to a list of, say, an ordered map, a tensor, a, a scalar, a tensor for the velocity, and whatever else not you want. Right? So this, this just does an expansion. I add a meta variable, which points to a type list of these tags just for convenience, so that I can index these things. And so now I also need a get function. Right? So normally with a std tuple, you'd use std get and give it some integer. But this, I might as well just make it a member function. Easy enough. And so I, I take as a template parameter the tag, right? So there's nothing happening here at runtime. I know the type that I'm returning because this tag has the type encoded inside of it. So I, I always know the type. And so then I can return it. And so since this, the this pointer you can dereference is also a std tuple, I can just call std get on myself using the index of the tag in my tag list, and then I have to get the value out. So this, this meta function returns a std integral constant, so basically a type that just holds this value. And then ultimately what you can do is you just, you just return a reference to it. And so you write overloads for these things for const l value references, r value references, and so forth, whatever you want. And so with this then, you have a really efficient data structure, and Someone mentioned the other day, uh, I think it was Tim, talking about const expr. Uh, you just put const expr in front of all of these things. And then what you get out of it is you get zero runtime code. There are no machine instructions output for any of this because the compiler knows everything at compile time. And it just inlines it. You force inline everything, and it doesn't even show up. All right. So, this is the actual central data structure. And so with this, you can actually do a lot. This answers the, we need something to do arbitrary communication. We need something that we can kind of stick anything we want in for something like an unordered map. Um, and it turns out, if you need any sort of map where you know what you're sticking into at a compile time, this is just the right answer. It's fast. It's rather easy to use. And once you have it implemented, it's Overall, it's, it's actually a fairly short implementation. So aside from a two-line constructor, uh, this is actually the entire implementation and some overloads for our value references. Uh, of course, it, the price you pay is that it's very dense. There's a lot of type names, a lot of colons, and a lot of angle brackets. All right, so how, what are we doing here in terms of this stuff in Spectre? So, I'm going to talk about data boxes first. So this is one of the problems. So this is uh, we need some sort of way of just storing different data. We don't know initially what for different simulations. If you're doing a burger's evolution, you're going to need different data than if you're doing uh, general relativity with neutron stars and neutrinos. They're completely different problems. So this is where sort of this tag tuple comes in. I'm sticking a bunch of different types of data all into one thing. And I know that what I'm sticking in at compile time but I have a different data structure, and I can compile an executable specifically for the evolution I want to do. So whatever specific thing you want to do, you compile for that. And so the other thing we want is we want lazy evaluation. So you, you, right, you, I maybe want to compute the mass every 30 time steps, and the thing I'm evolving is the density. Well, the 29 time steps where I don't care about the mass, why would I compute it? That seems insane. So you just don't compute it. You use lazy evaluation. So 
Then the other thing is, if I change, say, the density and I had previously computed the mass, I need to update that. I need to say, OK, my value of the mass is now wrong. I need to recompute it. And so this is sort of wh where this dependency analysis comes in. And then we need to lazily recompute, right? So I need to say, OK, well, the mass has changed, or the density has changed, so I need to reset this computation of the mass. But I need to do it so that it's evaluated lazily again. And so this is what these dependency graphs look like. Uh, don't worry about what the symbols mean. This is from GR. This is something that I, I drew while trying to figure out and develop this. But basically, we have this thing psi. And ultimately, the thing we want to compute is the square root of g over n. Um, and so you can see I need to compute n from psi. I need to compute g i j. g here is just the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. And then I'd need to compute the square root of it. And so going saying, when you say, OK, I want this, the way you can evaluate this is you just use std futures or std shared futures. So this is basically what Dharma is using in terms of lazy, their evaluation. You can use futures both as a threading model and also for lazy evaluation. So you can say, I want you to run on the same processor, but I want you to be lazy. And so it'll only be computed if it's actually needed. Then the other part of the problem is uh, when I change this guy, this information is now invalid. This is invalid. This is invalid. That's invalid, and all of that is invalid. All of that needs to be gone. I need to recompute it when I need it. And so that part of the process you can actually do at compile time. So what you do is you build a compile time dependency graph, just like this. And then when you update this, you evaluate that dependency graph, and you just reset whatever you need to reset. Um, it's, you know, so to get this working, sometimes you spend three hours writing four lines of code, but it works. So you can do all of that. And so this allows us to really only ever compute things when we need it. We store the data, because once the future has been evaluated, it just hangs out there. We can keep the result as long as we need it. And then when the result is no longer valid, we just reset it. Right? It's, it's really, so what the, this means is you can do really complicated long computations, and these dependency graphs can get huge, and the compiler will just take care of all of it. So uh, like I was saying, the, the, the solution, you use shared futures for the lazy evaluation. You build a compile time dependency graph, and then you, you analyze, it, analyze that when necessary. And sort of the way you analyze this graph is because you're using shared futures, um, you can do a lightweight pointer copy. So you basically just create a new data box when you modify something. Uh, but these modifications are only if you're resetting an item. So if you're just evaluating it, you don't need to create anything new. So um, that, that's that problem. The other problem I was talking about is this arbitrary communication thing. And so uh, this, for lack of a better name, we've named it tentacles. I believe this stems from that in the Spectre James Bond movie, the villain has a ring with an octopus on it, and octopus have tentacles. So that's, that's where this comes from. I didn't come up with it. but. We don't have anything better right now. And so each one of these tentacles is basically a char type. So right, you might have a char array. You might have a group. You might have a node group. You might have a single char. These are all conglomerated into this one tentacle entity. Right? And so uh, we do this sort of multi-phase initialization, where we initially just call basically default constructors to create all of the distributed objects everywhere. A second phase of initialization is then used where you're now able to communicate between all of these objects. So you can have arbitrarily complicated initialization patterns. Everybody can talk to everybody whenever they want. And then the third phase is some subset of all of these chars or tentacles actually start the simulation. And so basically, this is, again, the answer is you use a tag tuple and a type list, and you can do all of this. And so thing again, you use type traits and template metaprogramming. All of this is possible. And so from a user perspective, if you say, I want to observe data, so I want to write data to disk, I want to have discontinuous Galerkin elements, and you should probably always include the main one, 
this is what you specify in your main C++ file, and the compiler will just deal with everything else for you. If you also wanted to do, say, apparent horizon finding, so searching for black holes, you add that in your comma-separated list, and then you have that whole thing. It all gets compiled in, and it'll just work. You can just call it from any, anywhere you want. I, I know it sounds like magic, but it actually works. Um, so now, to, to one last thing is to, to kind of say, OK, well, how do you retrieve things? Right? I was saying you have these get functions. And so I want to get the local observer on this node, say. And so the key thing, one nice thing here is you get to use auto because type names can be annoying and they change and they can get long. So we want to use auto everywhere. And so then what you say is, well, this const global cache, that's where I'm storing sort of global data, like equations of state and these kinds of things, as well as all of the tentacles. It has a get function. So it basically, this wraps a tag tuple. You need this template keyword just for decoration purposes. Otherwise, the compiler will yell at you. But then in, in angle brackets, you say, hey, I want the observers. I want to be able to write data. And then, you know, this, for people familiar with Trump++, this just gets you the thing on your local node. But ultimately, this is the part that we've implemented. So you write that, you, you make this call, and you will get a type safe entity back. Everything is known in compile time. So the things I want to emphasize here is we can use things like auto that makes it much easier to maintain code because I don't need to write the explicit types. You generally shouldn't care about the types all that much unless things are actually failing to compile. And the other big thing is there's no dynamic casts. So you, you don't get runtime errors. They just don't exist. Um, you know, with Charm++, we sometimes get runtime errors. But in our own code, we've managed to effectively eliminate all of them. So uh, what does the current generation code look like? Again, we use Charm++ for parallelization. We're now doing non-uniform grids. So that means we're doing things like deformed cubes so that we can do spherical shells. Uh, we can have arbitrary orientations between them. The code is now much more modular. So like I was saying, you, you, don't, you, know, you just pick and choose the physics modules that you want, and those will get compiled in. We are able to get much better errors with template metaprogramming. You get compile time errors. You don't get runtime errors. And actually, well, this may be debatable, but the development is much easier. So once you have a lot of this backend infrastructure in place, there's not much in terms of development is really easy. The functions that the grad students are writing to write to, to add physics, they're just normal C++ functions. There's nothing fancy. They're not even template functions. They're just a simple function that takes a few different types, and that's it. They just get called, the results, the, the data they need magically appear at the right time for them, and they return some data later. Um, we're currently in progress of open sourcing this, as I was saying. So our last toy code was closed source, but we're now moving this into open source. Um, so we've started a GitHub. Uh, two days ago, I could have told you we only have a readme and a license, but now we have a couple CMake files. So can't say that anymore. Um, but yeah, so this will be something that once I'm done traveling and everything like that, in, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be sitting down and basically code reviewing everything and sticking it out on there. Lastly, uh, since yesterday we had this discussion about Charm++ wish list, I have some Charm++ wish list things. Um, one thing that we can now do uh, with Charm 6.9 is all the things I've had to patch to get a lot of this template metaprogramming stuff to work with Charm++, I can actually now submit back upstream. And uh, with that, I, I would like a little bit more support for template metaprogramming in Charm++. And uh, I have permission to actually offer some help with that from my advisor. And ideally, I think it's actually possible to completely replace the interface files just with template metaprogram. And so the benefit of that is you can remove a lot of undefined behavior where we've spent two or three hours trying to find some bug. And it was just we had one thing that was not quite in sync between our code and our interface file. And that resulted in some sort of undefined behavior. I missed an explicit instantiation, something like this. And so uh, my wish is that I don't have to write interface files. I maybe write a little bit of C++ code, but the compiler will scream at me and dump lots of errors in my face when I do something that's stupid. All right, thank you.
We have time for a few questions before lunch now. Thank you. So I, uh, that's awesome. That's, it's very interesting work. The, uh, are, are you really um, sh sure that, that, uh, that you can replace temp uh, CI files with template method programming? I'm that, that, is, that sounds magical. I'm almost what do you certain, think about yes. it, Sanjay? <laughs> um, I think you will need a fairly decent rewrite of some of the Charm++ backend stuff, but I'm almost certain that basically using these tag tuples, you can just replace everything. Um, my, my kind of view, the reason I kind of think that is because the CI files are basically metaprogramming, right? Charm C parses these, they dumps a bunch of interface files, a bunch of header files, and then we compile those. So why can't the compiler do that? It uh, makes a lot of sense in theory. I, I think it would be awesome. But. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so part of this is basically what, I'm, what we're trying to build on Charm++ is really a proof of concept that you can add this kind of an abstraction layer where currently all you need to do in our code, if you want to add, so there's one entry method. In that entry method, you tell it which member function to call and what type of data it is to receive. So these are, it's a template function. And the only thing we actually have to do with Charm++ is add an explicit instantiation in a CI file, and you have a new communication pattern. And so because of that, I think it really is possible. I think it would be really awesome to be able to do this. And I think you can do it, yes. It uh, sounds very interesting. I have one more question uh, with the tag topple. Yeah. Uh, have you, were you the one who, who put this on, on Stack Overflow, which no. is what I use? No, I, I found it and then I took it and then I built, uh, you know, several thousand lines on top of it, but that was sort of the starting, starting you've, point. So you've seen it and that's what you, it's basically the same thing what, yeah. what I found on Stack Overflow yeah. too, a yeah. few years ago. I, I'm using the same exact stuff for slightly different purpose, but it's the same idea. Yeah. It's a heterogeneous, hierarchical, type safe structure, yeah. container so, of anything. Yeah, and so there were, I can't remember what, there were some issues. I mean, it was a minimal example on Stack Overflow. Um, but yeah, keep an eye out. The, the, the tag tuple will be one of the first things that we'll be sticking on GitHub, because uh, it's you know, completely low level to everything we do. But you can basically do anything you want with it and really push it far. And there, there are different approaches to it. Um, to get sort of into a little bit of detail there, uh, you can, so I've decided to encode the type inside the tag. The other thing you can do is have, for the tag tuple, is you can have sort of pairs where you say, I want this tag associated with this type. So that's another way. Um, I can't remember what the Stack Overflow article did. That one is slightly different, and it's a lot more code, actually, um, barring the, uh, the overloads that you need yeah. to, the, for the get function. Yeah. But otherwise, it's very, it's very similar, and it's yeah. for a similar purpose. Yeah, and, and my decision ultimately was that if Tags I Tags are empty there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the difference. The reason I like this is because uh, this way I can't reuse a tag to represent a different type. But yeah, sure. right. I think this is kind of saner in a way. I can't just, I restrict it a little bit, but I think it's a reasonable restriction. I should not be able to use the density tag to represent a rank three tensor. That just makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Sounds so, good. Yeah. So I like your wish list. I'd also like to get rid of the interface files. But that being said, if you have a file with, was it 6,000 lines of code, of which 10 are runtime, yeah. I, you're saying that you're getting better error messages, yes. but what does better mean? Only 10 pages instead of 100, or? Actually, right, this is an interesting problem that, that we've had to deal with because, you know, I, currently, other than me and the collaboration, people look at these, their eyes glaze over, and then I get an email. Um, <laughs> the solution to that is actually static asserts. And so what you do is you trigger a static assert, and that static assert says, hey, this is the error, in cases that I've seen where this, you hit the static assert, this is most likely what you're doing, this is why you can't do it, and this is what you should do instead. So with that, I can make the error messages as clear as absolutely necessary so that somebody who doesn't want to spend their evenings 
scratching their head and being like, why can't I do this? And reading up in the C++ standard why you can't do that, uh, you can actually still write this code and use it. I want to see it before I believe it, but... Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll get to see it. <laughs> cool. Yes. Yes. So, so this is you know, uh, what, what Joseph is saying. So this is basically a poor man's implementation of C++ concepts, um, where it hopefully uh, C++ 20 will get concepts where when you, um, when you write this, this thing, instead of me saying class T, I can write associative T or sequence T. And then the compiler will go, hey, I don't know what to do with this because it's not a sequence, so I can't use this guy, and I can't use this guy because it's not an associative container. And that's the kind of error messages we want. And so it's not there in the language yet. And so currently you can emulate it with static asserts. It's not quite as clean, but it works quite well. But yeah, the C++ 20 will almost guarantee, is guaranteed to basically rewrite the rule book from scratch again. Well, they were talking about concepts for C++ 11. Yes. So <laughs> the, what makes you believe it will actually get into uh, 20? It's implemented in GCC. So there's a technical specification that is currently implemented in GCC. There was a technical spec for earlier versions too. Yeah, but it was never implemented. It, standard. it was never implemented. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can use concepts in GCC. And it, it narrowly missed, I think it was something like 50, mid 50% 50 of the people voted against sticking concepts in 17 because basically the conclusion was this is a huge thing. We want three years of actually having people use it in GCC and Clang before we finalize it because you don't want to screw that up. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, uh, let's thank our speaker one last time.